Good question. The, the, uh, the person who drags another person out of the cave in the metaphor is definitely another human being. It's, it's probably the philosopher, somebody else who's seen the difference, teacher, whatever you want to say, uh, pastor, coach, someone else who's seen the difference, who drags us out from the darkness of our own lives. Could it be an event? Um, I, I suppose you could say yes, except for that the event, whatever the event is, is the shock. It's the thing that releases us from the bonds. It's not the thing that drags us and trains us and carries us over a long distance. Only a human can do that. Uh, somebody else asked, is it possible to educate yourself? According to the, to the, the myth, no. There has to be someone else who trains us and drags us along. Now, could that person be long dead? Yes. So it is possible that you could, say, go um, embark on a journey where you plan to read every single Platonic text. And you really want to know what Plato's saying. So you're going to read every other author about Plato you can possibly get your mitts on. Big task, by the way. But if you chose that, you would be guided by another human, that is Plato, who's teaching you about the world. And it is possible in that vein that the dragger out is a long dead person rather than a living, breathing person. But one way or the other, I think he's suggesting that our own education has to come from another human being, another human person, not from just an event. The event, the earthquake or the lightning bolt, whatever it is, that causes us to stand up for the first time, I think that would be a cataclysm in our own life. It's what in the video calls the lesis, the cutting, the pain. Some pain causes us to not see the world as it is as sufficient anymore. Up to a certain point, we're perfectly satisfied with our burritos, our plastic Jesus, our Nintendo. We're good. It's cool. Everything's good. You know, I got the bathroom right there. What else do I need? A cataclysm occurs. Who knows what it is? Could be minor, like you see a movie and you're like, I never thought about that before and I'm, I feel stunned. Could be big, like a tornado rips your house away. Or uh, one of your beloved uh, brothers or mothers that gets killed. Something big happens and it causes you great pain. And it's the pain that forces you to no longer accept a world of just burritos, Nintendo, and bathroom. There's got to be more to the world than becoming a couch potato while playing, you know, Call of Duty 5 or whatever it is. Although that's pretty game. Uh, <laughs> I think that's what he's suggesting when he suggests the person is released from their bond. Some event occurs. And it hits back to the guy gets his ring, remember, with the, the earthquake and the uh, lightning bolt. They are cataclysms. We even use this now. It hit me like a lightning bolt. Or losing her was like an earthquake. My world was shattered. Well, that very imagery indicates that what he's saying seems to be true. When something horrible happens to us, we break a limb on the soccer field, we, we lose the state championship, uh, we fail a class, that cataclysm causes us to, to, to wake up, to realize that things are not hunky-dory. There's got to be something more. Yes, yes, the infinite regress question. I've heard this before. Uh, the idea is that eventually, wouldn't you have to have something other than a human dragging people out, right? Yes. Um, if we look at the myth literally, then yes, absolutely. There has to be some point where, like, Adam is dragged out by God or something, you know. But every every myth is limited. Every myth breaks down at a certain point. It's like with the myth of Adam and Eve. They they are kicked out of the garden and then they go down to a city of men. Huh? How's that possible? They're first humans, right? But the myth is designed to tell a specific thing, designed to convey a specific idea. They're not concerned with absolute accuracy. They're concerned more with telling something about the human condition. So is the myth of Adam and Eve any less true because they get kicked out of Eden and go down to a city of men? No, because the author isn't concerned with that. Same thing here. If we go infinite regress uh, backwards in time, we'd have to eventually come to a point where one philosopher is dragged out by a monkey or something. But that's not the point of the myth. The myth breaks down at some point, and we just have to accept the fact that that's not what he's getting at. He's getting at rather our education is like this. Someone else drags us out. Then they live a life that's uh, a life of being dead. So like a walking dead man.
That's easily read. This is something which is very hard for us to accept, I think, because most of us think that everybody goes to heaven. All dogs go to heaven. Right? And just by being charming and sweet and cool, we're going to be in. Right? The bouncer of heaven, will, Peter, will allow us in. You, you, not you, but you. And, and somehow we'll just get it. We'll, we'll waft in through those pearly gates. Because we're just so nice, Jesus must love us. But what Plato seems to indicate, and by the way, what Christ indicates too, which is kind of scary, is that not only will not everybody get in, but the number that gets into heaven is very small. Very small. That gives me chills sometimes when I think about this. Will I be one of them? I think what Plato is suggesting is that the people that never move out of this realm of images or icons, Never move out of that realm with images and icons. By using them, you live your entire life being brain dead. And then when you die, you die. I just thought it was like, even if they're God, they still feel like they're worth the fact that it's never happened. Yeah. According to Plato, they'd be living a life of darkness. Yeah. It's, yeah, that's pretty much it. As awful as that sounds to us, as unfair as that sounds. If you never had someone else to bring you out, you would essentially live your entire life, 60, 70 years old, and still in the dark, still living the life of the sin. No fault of your own. That's what it is. That's what it is. And in some ways, it's like if you get pinned under a rock, and if you get pinned under a rock, it's not your fault, but what, what are you going to do? You cut your arm off or you die. Well, he doesn't go so far as to say that. I do have to be clear on that. He doesn't go so far as to say it's only a state of mind. He suggests that it is a state of mind. Now, whether that state of mind then continues perpetually when we kick the bucket or not, it's up for speculation. And I think in some ways, Peter wouldn't be concerned with that. What he is concerned with is there is this state of mind, which is like that. And we either try to achieve it, or we live in a realm of darkness. And then if it's if it continues after we die, score. But that's I mean that's outside of his party in some way. After all, who has died and come back and given us a book, right? Very few people died. And and those who have, I sometimes question. What did you see? Was it a big light? Never heard that one before. What I what I think Plato is saying is that the event breaks the bindings. And then you have to Pray for someone to bring you out, yes. You have to have two factors. One is you have to have some big event that happens to you. And that event normally is painful, which is unfortunate, but that's the way it is. And after that painful event, someone has to come along and show you the right way. And, and, and God help us that when that big event comes, there is somebody who will show us the right way. If there isn't, it's just pain. It's like that bumper sticker, poo poo happens, you know. There's no there's no reason for it. And that same pain can cause us to wither as much as it can cause us to be ready to get out of the cave. Which is why the importance of evangelism is so big. You know, to be an evangelist doesn't mean just going out to everybody and saying, Have you got Christ? It's really it's it's finding the people that have suffered this horrible thing and trying to help them make sense of it to, to get out of their own bonds, their own shame. It's a great movie called The Apostle, which I just love this movie with Robert Duvall, which is all about this. You know, it's all about this, this desire to help other people. And his home life is a total wreck, of course, but he tries to help other people. It's really kind of a delightful movie in that way. Yes, except for that, it's, again, it's a metaphor. Did you make that clear? It's a metaphor. He's not saying that he's infected, like, diseased or something. It's that darkness... Ignorance is itself like a disease. It's, it's similar to it. When you go back into the world at large, you have this vision of greatness and beauty. But you have to use the terms of the world at large to talk to other people. And consequently, there's this risk of your not only not being able to see well. To, to, you don't remember the names of Michelle, Megan, Martha, Fox. I mean, what's their name? I remember the dark hair and the eyes. It's like Melissa Fox or Maude Fox or something. What's their name? You don't remember that stuff. Your eyes are dark. And then you see the pictures, you're like, oh, okay, Megan Fox, yeah. Yeah, Megan. 
And so you, you, you have the possibility of becoming even more infected in that you start falling in love or whatever with the things of this world. So there's a possibility that a person who's seen that vision can not only appear deaf and, and dumb in the, this world, but also there's a possibility that they could be attracted to the things of this world too much so. That is a possibility. Well, how can that be? I, I'm trying to avoid saying it just does. It happens, I think, because the, pe the, the objects he's talking about are human beings, not angels. And as human beings, when we have this great vision, we still have the tendency to fall into being attracted to mortal things. There's not, it doesn't go away. We just learn how to deal with it. We're better at it than the person who's never been outside of the cave. But we still have the possibility of falling in love with those cave shadows. And, 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 and I don't know if that happens. How does that happen? But it does say that it does happen. He's not talking angels here. He's not even talking people that have died and come back. So it's not like you're some radiant spirit that now comes down to the world. You're still human. You could go crazy. Yeah, you might. Um, and consequently, you have to you have to constantly exert a certain consciousness, a certain awareness, and power that holds the world together, that holds your vision together, that holds your consciousness together. Um, yeah, what he seems to be suggesting is when you start seeing these greater and greater abstracts, you begin to see from a, from a bird's eye perspective, you know, looking down at the world, because you see these patterns repeating all over and over again in, in, in the created world itself, which nobody else seems to see. And to people in the world, that may seem crazy. But to the person who actually sees it, he may be seeing something very, very real, very close to what the, the real pattern of the world is. Is. And by abstraction, just to kind of talk around this answer, what, what do we mean when we talk about God? What do we mean when we talk about the good? What do we mean when we talk about the abstraction that is God? One way that we could talk about it is by asking the question, why is there so much God? Where does it come from? What's its origin? What's its purpose? Is there a purpose to it? You can certainly go the scientific route and say that it all is just haphazard. It's like matter cooling from energy. But then where did the energy come from? Why is it cooled in those patterns? Why is the cellular growth and always of the same nature? Does it follow something beyond the physical world? Plato seems to suggest that, that the thing that follows beyond the physical world is a mathematical proportion. That mathematical proportion then repeats in certain specific forms. Those forms are themselves a pattern of a conscious mind. And so you're looking at a conscious mind when you're looking at the whole world. But it, it, it's asking the question, why are we here? Why is anything here? What's our purpose or end goal? Or do we have a, a, an end goal? Or is it all just one damn thing after another? And I think once we begin asking those questions, then we start moving to really think about the nature of who this God is. It might drive you mad, yeah. You might end up eating locusts and wild honey and you know, dressing in camels. But it might also be that that madness that the world sees is a real sanity, possible. And if you have a better alternative than Plato, feel free to offer it. He says what the world's going to end up. Because I don't know, I don't know if it exists, and it certainly doesn't exist in the Christian world because Christianity is entirely platonic. Well, almost entirely platonic. A little bit of Jewish slavery thrown in. Is the knowledge itself painful, or just the the, the, the breaking of the of the bond? <sighs> when you lift weights, you end up being hurt afterwards, right? You're tearing muscle after all, and it causes you to be pained the next day. But you find that you can lift more and more weights, right? And then when you're carrying around these gigantic guns wherever you go, right? There's still there's still a level of pain. But it's not pain like when you are first some wimpy guy trying to lift 10 pounds, okay? It's more the pain of, I, I'm used to this. This is the way things are. 
know, and, and so is there pain with the knowledge? Um, I think he's suggesting a similar parallel here. Knowledge is like lifting weights, and it becomes less painful as you go, but there's still a certain level of pain, but that's life. Life is painful. It, it's not... It's not that the, the, there's any point where just the pain's gone. It's just you get used to it, you endure it, you're stronger, you're, you're more powerful than you were before, faster than a speeding bullet. There's a great analogy in martial arts when you move from white belt to black belt. White belt, novice, beginner, you don't know nothing. And you progress through the different levels, the colors, until you get to black belt. Black belt is you've mastered the material. You still feel pain when you're in a bout, but you're used to it. That's life. That's what the martial arts are about, giving and inflicting pain. Therefore, you wear a black belt. I, very much what he's suggesting, too, I think. The knowledge is always painful, but it's, that's the way life is. And you're certainly stronger for it. Yeah, I think that he would say ignorance is bliss, but ignorance is not happiness. It's a difference. Okay? Bliss is more like you're kind of not really, you're like a lotus eater. You're not really caring. It's just I'm blissful right now. But your feet are rotting. You've got dysentery. You just don't notice it. You know, you're covered in shite, but it's okay. Uh, that's bliss. Happiness is like you're not covered in shite. <laughs> that's happiness. <laughs> like they say in uh, Mighty Python, how do you know he's a king? He's not covered in shite, right? Uh, <laughs> I think what he's suggesting is that, yes, ignorance is bliss, but ignorance is not happiness. The people that are in the cave, they're perfectly satisfied with where they are. But it doesn't mean that they're healthy. It doesn't mean that they're, they're powerful. It doesn't mean that they've seen the difference. And it also doesn't mean they're free. Just because you're satisfied with where you are doesn't mean you're not a slave. You may be a slave and perfectly happy with the fact that you're beaten every day and you have a chain around your neck. But, you know, um, but if you've seen the difference, if you've tasted freedom, you even have an inkling of the beauty of what he's talking about, you can no longer be satisfied with the chain around your neck. It has to come off. And that's what he says is this whole movement is talking about. 